Hello, Geneva. Um, I'm so sorry that we're not able to join you today, but I'm sure it is a fabulous conference. Yeah, I'm also sorry that I'm not there in person, but at least we can join virtually. So let's get to it. Nuvo, I'd say uh, it was a great pleasure to see you again. It is a great pleasure to interview you. It is a moment of extreme change on a subject about which you know a lot. So my first question for you, a lot has happened in AI in the last six months. Yeah. You've been writing about AI for years. You've been warning about the risks to democracy of AI for years. What has changed in your critique or your concern as you've watched large language models and generative AI explode in the last few months? I think I think things are happening just much faster than we expected, even people in the field. And I think um, everybody should really know just three things about it. You know, you, you hear so much about AI, but you really need to know three things. First of all, this is the first tool in human history that can make decisions by itself. It's nothing like any previous invention in history. Atom bombs could not make decisions. They couldn't decide who to bomb. AI can make decisions by itself. The second thing everybody needs to know is that this is the first tool in human history that can create new ideas by itself. You know, printing presses or radios, they couldn't create ideas. They could disseminate our ideas. But AI can create completely new ideas. And the third thing everybody should know is that humans are not very good at uh, uh, using new tools, new technologies. We often make mistakes. It takes us time to learn how to use new tools in a beneficial, in a wise way. You know, if you look at the Industrial Revolution, which many people compare the current AI revolution to the Industrial Revolution, this is uh, uh, quite a pessimistic comparison because when humans learned how to use the tools of the Industrial Revolution, we made some terrible mistakes on the way. Imperialism, uh, uh, Nazism, communism, the two world wars, they were all mistakes on the way to learning how to use the tools of the Industrial Revolution. If we make similar mistakes with AI, this could really be the end of our species. And last thing is that while we are learning to use AI, it is learning to use us. So we have even less time and less margin for error uh, than with any than with any previous invention. I want to spend most of this conversation talking about how to regulate AI, yeah. at the course to reduce the risks, the policies that very smart folks watching this should be thinking about. But let's let's go back to that point that this is in some ways you're saying the most dangerous technology ever created. Right now, AI can't give a biography of Yuval Noah Harari, right? If I go into OpenAI and I type and give me a bio, it will get things wrong. It makes all kinds of mistakes. It's, it's not actually that good yet. How long will it take to develop from this kind of adolescent, confused, messed up chatbot into, you know, the death destroyer of worlds that... Uh, we see in the worst case? I don't think it will develop into the kind of destroyer of, world, of worlds. The dangers of AI don't necessarily come from this super intelligent machine that can predict and do everything. It can come also from primitive AI, which we already have. If we think about social media, for instance, and the way that it eroded uh, public trust, that it eroded democratic institutions all over the world, this was done with very, very primitive AI. That basically, you know, in social media, you have these algorithms that try, that tried to maximize for user engagement. And the algorithms discovered, largely by trial and error, that the easiest way to increase user engagement, to grab people's attention, is by spreading outrage. This is something AI discovered about human nature, and it used it. And it destroyed uh, uh, trust and institutions and the public conversations in, in many countries. We now have this curious situation when 
we have the most sophisticated information technology in history, and people can no longer agree on anything. People can no longer have a meaningful conversation. And this is with this very primitive AI. So we don't need to wait for this, you know, science fiction or all powerful AI uh, to be worried. Now, of course, AI can also be used for, for, for the good. It, it's the most dangerous technology we've ever created, and it is also potentially the most beneficial in a, a technology that we ever created. So it's not about completely banning it, which is in any way impossible. It's about regulating it to make sure that it is used for good and not for ill. Now, how long, do we, how much time do we have? It's very difficult to say. You know, 10 years ago, there was no AI. Really. People were talking about it, but it, 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 it was still, for most people, it was science fiction. The whole AI revolution is, you know, it's, it's just less than 10 years old. It's just making its first baby steps, but it is progressing at, at such a fast pace that nobody has any idea where we will be in, say, 10 years. Yeah. All right. Well, actually, I would just like to say, you said it's impossible to have a good, sophisticated conversation. You've all, I feel like we're having one right now, but I do, uh, I do get your point. So let's talk about the pace of change, because that is clearly underpinning so much of the concerns. If the changes that had happened over the last six months had happened over five years, we would have a much better chance of figuring out the norms. If the changes in the Facebook algorithm had happened over a period of many years, we could have figured out the norms, right? So is there anything that can be done to change the speed at which this is evolving? I know you signed a letter saying to stop development of AI if you're going to build a large language model larger than GPT-4. That didn't have an effect as far as I know, um, or did at least it didn't change OpenAI's behavior or Microsoft's behavior. What needs to happen to change the speed at which this is going? I think we need to differentiate between development and deployment. It's very difficult to stop the development because we have this arms race mentality. People are aware of some of them, of the dangers, but they don't want to be left behind. But the really crucial thing, and this is the good news, the crucial thing is to slow down deployment, not development. You can have an extremely sophisticated AI tool in your laboratory as long as you don't deploy it out into the public sphere, uh, this is less dangerous. You know, it's like you have this very dangerous virus in your laboratory, but you don't release it to the public sphere, that's fine. That's, 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 the, there is a margin of safety there. The same way that it is, you know, unthinkable, that forget about viruses. I mean, drug company that develop a powerful new medicine, they can't start just selling it to the public without going through some safety checks. And if you develop a new car, you can't just put it on the road without first going through safety checks. It should be the same with AI. We should better understand its potential impact on society, on, on culture, on psychology, and on the economy of the world before we deploy it into the public sphere. But be a little more specific. So. I develop a large language model. It's better than GPT-4. I would like to compete. I need to pay my developers, my venture capitalists. They want to they wanna return. I've got this software. It's going to help doctors all over the world. In fact, doctors in Africa are going to be able to cure people. And what regulatory authority do I need to go to? And I don't even understand how this thing works. The people who made AI aren't quite sure why it works this way. What government authority is going to look at it and be able to say, you know, that's safe. Mm -hmm. That's a very big issue. I mean, we don't have the regulatory bodies in place. This is what we need to establish as, as soon as possible. You know, you can have a regulation, for instance, that for you need to devote, say, I don't know, 20% of any investment in AI for, to safety and regulation. We don't have the institutions to regulate AI because we haven't invested in them. And because if you now finish a PhD in computer science and you specialize in AI and the government offers you one salary to, to, to come to the, I don't know, legal department and the private industry offers you 10 times or 100 times more 
to go to them, then it's quite obvious where most people would go. So we need to invest a lot more in safety and in regulation, and we can do it. Again, a, a simple, simple in, in, in conceptual terms, a simple first step is simply to have a regulation that there is a fixed amount, a fixed percentage of every investment in AI must go to safety. But so you're saying that if I have my, again, my large language model, I've built it with my, you know, I've hired my team of developers. I have to put one in five of them on safety yes. and some government authority will well, certify that I've done that. The same way that when you develop a car, you have some people working on making the car uh, go as fast as possible, but you have people working on safety because you know, even if you have no ethics of your own, you know that no government will allow your car on the road unless it's safe. And but, if, but I, I'm very compelled by this argument, and so it's a, it's, it, it would be wonderful. I'm just kind of, let's go back to the thing you mentioned before, social media. No. Let's say that Facebook. Mm -hmm. had taken their algorithm or Twitter had taken their algorithm. And they would have certainly argued that they have 20% of their people working on safety, right? They're knocking out nudity. They're trying to find jihadists. They're spending a lot of time on that. How would any government authority have been able to look at that algorithm and say 2012 and anticipated the effects it would have had on democracy in the years that followed? But I don't think anybody can anticipate, say, 10 years in advance or even five years in advance. It's any regulatory institution that deals with AI will need to be able to react very fast to learn things on the fly. Now, you know, when people began to see the uh, harm of the social media algorithms in 2016, in 2017, in places like Myanmar, they sounded the alarm, but the corporations didn't react. It's not that nobody understood what was happening. It's not only with hindsight we know, no. There were people sounding the alarm at the time of very, uh, uh, quite fast after things began to happen, but there was no response. Now, again, if, if all the talent goes only to the private corporations uh, that develop the technology, then it's a lost battle. But if enough of the talent is encouraged and empowered to go either into government bodies or into NGOs, that take it on themselves to uh, uh, to regulate and to check for safety. And safety means social safety and psychological safety. Then I think we'll be on, 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 on better grounds. And again, for societies, especially democratic societies, this is an existential issue. And I think also for the tech companies themselves, at least some of the voices you're hearing coming from private businesses is we understand the danger of what we are doing. Please help us regulate this because by ourselves, it's not, just, it's not that we don't trust ourselves. It's because we understand the kind of arms race dynamic within the market. We understand it without some, some external authority forcing us to regulate, it will not happen. So one of the concerns I have about the big companies coming and asking to be regulated. We've seen Sam Altman has been traveling the world and Brad Smith from Microsoft is in Washington. One of the concerns I have is that their desire to be regulated may come from moral concerns. It may come from the fact that if they are heavily regulated, no one will be able to compete with them. If the government says, you know what, in order to have an AI company, you gotta have 20% of your people on safety, you have to certify, you need an off switch, you need a lawyer who's going to comply with the regulations in Denmark and make sure that it all you know, matches up with the regulations in the United States. Mm -hmm. Only the big companies can do that. And then their power increases. GDPR only increased the power of the big social media companies. Are we going to do that again? Mm -hmm. That's a very good question. I'm not sure about the answer. But first of all, already at present, the kind of resources you need in money, in data, in people to develop the, the really powerful models is such that it is a game of very few competitors. Um, certainly, if you think in global terms, then very few countries are leading this AI revolution. 
And you know, talking at, at the UN with representatives from throughout the world, this is extremely dangerous. Again, the previous time something like this, this happened in the 19th century with the Industrial Revolution, we had a few countries leading the Industrial Revolution and then very quickly conquering and exploiting the rest of the world. And this can happen again with AI in new ways. You know, with the AI revolution, you don't need to send soldiers into a country in order to basically conquer it. You just need to take the data out. You can control it from, from afar. Yeah. So when we talk about regulation, it's not just the issue of, you know, a national government with its corporations. It's also a global issue of how all these countries that don't have, they are not really competitors in the AI race, how are they going to face the consequences? Because obviously that the technology will impact everyone, not just the front ones. So let's go back to the Industrial Revolution and let me ask you mm -hmm. about regulation back then. So electricity gets invented. We don't regulate electricity, we regulate the uses of electricity. You can't use electricity for this particular bad thing, but electricity is out in the open. We don't regulate, we do regulate trains, but we don't say, I guess we do regulate trains. So electricity is the better example. <laughs> so isn't AI more like electricity than like trains or cars where it's underlying all this stuff and we should regulate the outputs and the uses? No, it's again, it's, it's, it's even more extreme than, than, it's, than trains. Because as I said in the beginning, AI can make decisions by itself. It could create new ideas by itself. Uh, it's more like humans than it is like trains. And it, it's potential, again, politically, economically, culturally, to disrupt human society is, is immense. Now, again, the, there are many, many of the regulations we are talking about uh, can be, again, conceptually quite simple. It's taking very old laws and rules and simply applying them to the new realm of information technology and, and AI. If you think about a, a law, for instance, like don't steal, this is not a new invention, don't steal, but part of the business model of the, of the big companies, of the tech giants, was to say that the world of information technology in the online world is completely different from the physical world. So laws that like don't steal, they don't apply to data. We can take your data and do anything we want with it, and this is not stealing. And regulation to, to a large extent simply means no. Whatever um, you know, rules and norms that humans developed over thousands of years to deal with things like, I don't know, wheat fields, that you can't take somebody's wheat field, if they also apply to the digital reality and to data. You can't take my data and use it to manipulate me or to sell it to a third party without my permission. Similarly, for thousands of years, we had laws against counterfeiting money. It, te technically, it's very easy. To, it's, it was always very easy to create fake money, whether it's coins or banknotes or whatever. Once money became central to the financial system, in order to, to, to protect the financial system, governments uh, enacted very strict rules against counterfeiting money. You, you, in most places, you would be executed. It was one of the worst crimes imaginable. Now, nobody ever enacted rules against creating fake people because it was technically impossible. There were rules against fraud, but not against creating fake people. Now it is possible for the first time in history to create fake people, to create billions of fake people. Like you interact with somebody online and you don't know if it's a real human being or, or a bot. I mean, in a year, probably this conversation like we are having now, it would be almost impossible to be sure whether you're talking with a deep fake or with a real human. Now, if this is allowed to, to happen, it will do to society what fake money threatens to do to the financial system. If you can't know who is a real human and who is a fake human, trust will collapse. And with it, at least free society.
maybe dictatorships will be able to manage somehow, but not democracies. And we just need very strict rules against faking people. If you fake people, or if you allow fake people on your platform without taking effective countermeasures, so maybe we don't execute you, but you go to 20 years in jail. And yes. you'll surprised how quickly the tech giants will find ways to prevent the platforms from being overflown with fake people. It, can you relax the regulation slightly since I created a whole bunch of fakes along with my 12 year old uh, recently while playing with some software and yeah, yeah. Uh, you're right but, but, please allow me to the same no. cell I really love the little guy <laughs> not that you're not allowed to create them you are not allowed to pass them in public as real people I mean okay. situations when it would be wonderful to interact with an AI let's say an AI doctor it can be extremely helpful to interact with an AI doctor, provided it's very clear that this is not a human doctor. This is an AI doctor. When I interact with an AI doctor or journalist or whatever, I need to know whether it's a real human being or an AI. As what long as you know it, it's What if it's a customer service rep? What if you lost your luggage and it's just you're calling United Airlines, you need your bag back? Do you care? I need to know that it's that it, if it's a real human or not. I mean, if they have a two it's a two second announcement, you are about to to be connected to an AI uh, uh, bot, and now I have the conversation and it provides what I need. I have no problem with it. But so I then, okay. So what about this case? So clearly, we're debating and we're on. Um, let's say we're talking on Twitter. And you and I are going back and forth. You're, let's say Twitter had its old verification system where it was based on being a real person. You call and you show your driver's license or whatever you do. Um, you and I are both verified. But every time you say something, I just have another browser open and I type into OpenAI, hey, what should I write back to Yuval to most convince him of my viewpoint? Do I need to declare that? Well, I'm not sure. My, my gut reaction is that's fine. I mean, people are doing it in, in different ways, at least. You basically, in, in doing what you described, you are taking responsibility for what you are saying. And for instance, I don't know, if you say something that's defamatory, uh, uh, you are liable to it. There is a real human being that has taken responsibility and that in theory at least is kind of, of, of betting what the AI is, is, is telling if if if, if you're, you 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 are just saying whatever the AI tells you to do blindly, that's on you. So part of the thing is is that it also prevents you know it's a question of numbers of you know um, at, at present on social media we are not sure how many users are bots, but because bots can you know a bot can tweet hundreds of times an hour in a way that most humans can't. And even though bots are apparently a small percentage of Twitter users, they create, they're responsible for a large volume of the conversations or of the communication on Twitter. Now, what happens if you have a social media platform when it's not just bots that retweet what a human created? You have millions, potentially billions of bots that can create content that is in many ways superior to what humans can create, like more convincing, more appealing, whatever, more, more tailored to your specific personality in life history. If we allow this to happen, then basically humans have lost complete, completely lost control of the public conversation. And things like democracy will become completely unworthy. Now, if, if, if you want to talk politics with a bot online, okay, I mean, I, I can't prevent you from doing it. But to preserve a democratic uh, society, uh, we need to prevent a situation when the conversation is simply being swamped and hijacked by potentially unlimited numbers of bots. This, this makes all good sense. Let me give you a different framework for regulation that, that I've heard from some people, which is, it's going to be too hard to regulate the bad stuff. We, we don't know how these things work. We can't really conceive what they're going to do. 
if we try to prevent all kinds of bad things, we're just going to allow for regulatory capture and we probably won't prevent them anyway. So instead, what government should do is they should try to support as many good uses as possible. Because as you said, AI will be used for good, AI will be used for ill. If we have more that's used for good, maybe it cancels out. So if that were the logic, then a government should build a data set that AIs could train on and only allow access to nonprofits, universities, maybe companies that they've certified because they're doing good things. They're only teaching kids chemistry or trying to cure AIDS or trying to promote civil conversation. What do you think of that framework? Government should focus on supporting the good, not stopping the bad. I'm completely for uh, supporting the good. And for instance, have, uh, uh, building, say, a government database, which is open to NGOs and so forth, in order to be able to compete with the private sector players. But it cannot, uh, it cannot replace regulating at least the more dangerous potential of, of AI. Um, again, like we have in, in a field like medicine, but yes, we focus on uh, doing good. But if we now lift all regulation for medicine, anybody can, can create, I don't know, a, a, a new drug and start selling it to people. Or anybody can experiment on viruses in a lab and then release them to the public sphere to see what happens. Um, this will be catastrophic. And, so, and doing it with AI, like lifting all regulations, my guess is that it will be even more catastrophic, partly because AI is already today able to synthesize new drugs and new viruses. I mean, you can ask an AI to synthesize a new virus for you. You can ask it what would be the best way to create the greatest harm, how to spread it, and, and, and so forth. So uh, we, we obviously cannot just uh, uh, rely on doing good. There are many situations in history when there is an imbalance between good and evil. You know, like with war and peace. It takes a lot of people to, uh, 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 to make peace and sometimes just one person to start a war. Um, so if we don't regulate the negative potential, all the good that AI is definitely going to do for, for, for humanity may turn out to be not enough to save it. Let me ask you, we're running very short on time, but let me ask you one last impossible to answer big question. Um, though you answer everything very well. I love talking with you, you of all. Um, yep. One of the arguments made for why the West and democracy should go quickly on AI is that we're essentially in a geopolitical arms race. Yeah. And if the democracies, you know, they're trying to make sure everybody's real, you've government commissions, you have to certify 20% of your time is being spent on the safety stuff. And then North Korea says, you know what? let's go, right? Or more likely, China says, let's go. Then AI develops in a totally different way. And mm -hmm. in fact, the AI bots and the AI systems built in non-democratic countries become massively more powerful and it shifts the power of the world. Do you worry about that? Um, oof, so many things to say about that. Uh, first of all- I have two minutes left, Yuval. Okay. First of all, we are not talking about stopping development, but deployment. Now, if we don't regulate deployment, this will definitely destroy democracy much faster than any scheme by a North Korean tyrant or, or whatever. Um, we need regulation in order to save democracy. If we don't have regulation, we will destroy ourselves. And also take into account that dictatorships are also terrified by the new AI, by the new large language models in particular. Because dictatorships, they rely on fear in order to manage the information system. You tell a joke about the leader, or you tell something that the regime doesn't want to hear, you go to some ghoul. Now, how do you frighten an AI? What will you say to the AI? If you tell this joke, if you go on telling jokes about our leader, or if you expose this Think from our past that nobody is supposed to know, you will go to the AI guru. They have no idea how to uh, 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 stop the AI from spilling the beans. They can prevent the AI from access, but that's going to be very difficult. And that will cause them to lag behind. Actually, in this particular situation, democracies, because they, I mean, they are threatened, but they have a, a, a larger margin 
for that they are better able to uh, uh, survive with a certain amount of pollution in their information system. For dictatorships, it's much, much harder because they tend to rely on zero uh, uh, um, opposition voices in their information network. And how do you stop an AI from voicing the, uh, problematic ideas? Nobody knows that. So I'm afraid we are out of time. I hope everyone in Geneva, we have not polluted your information environment. I feel like when we talk with you all, it is nothing but cleaning the information environment. It is a wonderful, it is an honor, it is a pleasure. It is always fascinating to talk with you at this moment. It is so important. Thank you so much, Yuval Noah Harari. Thank you. All right, everybody have a wonderful rest of the afternoon. Thank you so much.